6. Very familiar verse of scripture. Acts chapter 26. 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I'd like for us to look at the setting somewhat here of how <coughs> it came to this point that it came to Agrippa. And if you look in the book of Acts, you find that there's about five chapters dedicated to telling us about Paul, his imprisonment, his appearing before three different rulers and talking with them. Paul was imprisoned, of course, because he had made the decision to tell the truth, to speak forth the words of righteousness. And that did not, was not popular with the Jewish people. They became angry as he spoke to them. And things became so violent that the soldiers had to come in and restore order and take Paul out of their midst to protect him from being killed. And I don't want to go into too much detail. I know we're familiar with the story of Paul. But as we look in the... Whenever Paul was captured there and taken before Felix. In chapter 24, in fact. Felix had a desire to understand what was going on and what was happening. And he brought Paul before him. In verse 25 we read, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and justice to come, Felix trembled. He actually shook and trembled. And he answered, Paul, go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. The Bible tells us he also hoped that Paul would be able to get some money together and give to him so that he would have a reason to release him. So as Paul reasoned with Felix, of righteousness, temperance, and the reality that there is a judgment to come. The Spirit of God dealt with that man in such a way that he trembled. He understood what Paul was saying. He understood and felt the Holy Spirit drawing his heart and convicting him of his sin and wrongdoing. And the conviction was so sharp that he actually trembled and shook in the presence of God. He realized that he needed something that he did not have. He realized that he had a guilt and a responsibility before God. But we see that he was not willing to yield. And he chose to say, Maybe later. Maybe there'll be a better time for this. Not right now. And of course, he kept Paul in prison for a couple of years. But came a time whenever Felix was replaced by a man named Festus. And whenever the new ruler came in, the Jews were right there and ready to plead their case again and try to get this man to put Paul into their control or to kill him. They wanted Paul dead. They weren't content with the idea of just having him punished, having him sent away. They wanted him dead. 
That was the level of hatred they had for the message that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They were afraid of that message. You can see sometimes how a person views something by their reaction to it. The Jews level of anger and that level of bitterness and desire to destroy Paul tells us something about the reality of what they, their response to his teaching tells us about how they really viewed that. They were afraid of that truth. They hated the idea that in any way they could be wrong and that Jesus was the Son of God. They wanted to kill Paul because they saw that as a way to kill the message that he was bringing to them. But as Festus talked to Paul and he talked to the Jews, he wasn't really able to come to an understanding of exactly what the crime was. But he was hesitant to offend the Jews by setting Paul free. So he asked Paul if he was willing to go up to Jerusalem to be judged and to hear the case more in depth. And as you know, Paul appealed unto Caesar. He had that right as a Roman soldier. And he took that right and he appealed unto Caesar. Rather than go to Jerusalem and give the Jews another chance to kill him. The Festus was put in a little bit of a difficult situation then because he was going to send a man to Caesar to be judged. They didn't really know what his crime was. What had he really done? What was the crime that he was guilty of? And we come to the time when King Agrippa came to visit. And Festus took that opportunity to say, here's a man that's familiar with the Jews and understands this Jewish religion. Maybe he can help me to understand what to tell Caesar whenever I send Paul to him. And so if you look in chapter 25, we see that Agrippa said of Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Augustus said, Tomorrow thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city. At Festus's commandment, Paul was brought forth. Think about that setting. You had here the ruler, Festus, and you had a king, King Agrippa, and you had the principal people of the city the chief captain. And they were gathered together in a place of fury. They were gathered together in some kind of a, a hall or assembly where they would have the opportunity to gather a large group of people and to hear someone speak. And these were people of circumstances. These were people of some wealth and power. People that had authority. King Agrippa there said, and Bernice the king with great pomp. There was a lot of ceremony because the king was here. And Festus, whenever they came and gathered together, he said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, we see this man about whom all the multitudes of the Jews dealt with me, both in Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appeared to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write to my Lord. Wherefore I have brought it before you, and especially before the O King Agrippa, 
But after examination had it, I might have some like to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not with all to signify the crimes laid against them. King Agrippa made a very short statement to Paul. He said, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. So we have the stage set. All is gathering of people and a prisoner there in their midst. They were no doubt in their best clothing, looking very stylish and wealthy, showing how important they were. And Paul, a prisoner, no doubt plainly dressed, standing in the midst of all those people. And Paul, throughout his imprisonment, had never apologized for the truth. He had never changed the message. He had never endeavored to say, well, maybe it was some misunderstanding, and how about if I don't say that anymore? No, he was always true. He spoke the truth to whichever person he was speaking with. And even here in this setting, he was not afraid. He was not afraid to be before all these people. He was not afraid of what they could do to him. He answered King Agrippa and he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. That first verse said, Paul, stretch forth the hand. It would be interesting to have seen Paul speak. He was a mighty apostle. He was filled with the Spirit of God. He understood the truth of the gospel. He believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He understood and knew the reality of salvation. He knew why Jesus came. He understood what Jesus could do in a human life. He was a witness because he had experienced himself. And you see here that Paul was happy to talk to King Agrippa because he said, I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. He knew that Agrippa was familiar with what had happened in the last few years. He knew that King Agrippa was familiar with the reality that Jesus had come and taught and worked amongst the people, and that he had been slain by the Jews. I believe that King Agrippa knew that there was a group of people that believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. He was familiar with this. Later on, Paul said, these things were not done in a corner. This was something that people knew about, that people had experienced. As Paul began to speak to this group of people, he started at his youth. He told them about his upbringing, about he had been raised as a Pharisee. And not just any Pharisee, but a stranger sect of the Pharisees. And he lived that life. He believed what he had been taught, and he believed that he was right in the sight of God. And he believed that he was doing God's will when he persecuted those that believed in Jesus Christ. I don't believe that Paul was a hypocrite. He was doing what he thought was right. <coughs> He was trying to stamp out what he viewed as a blasphemous and incorrect teaching. And Paul explained that to King Agrippa. But he goes on to tell him, after he told him about punishing the Jews and how anxious he was to 
do the same thing to the believers as what the Jews were trying to do to him now. In verse 12 we read, Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Think what he experienced at that moment. But everything that he believed in, that he was doing, was right, was suddenly disproven. Supernaturally. In a way that he could not argue with. Jesus speaking to him, saying, Why persecutest thou me? He brought face to face with the reality that he was persecuting the Son of God. That he was fighting against God. Against God's plan. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul said, I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. What a moment. What a moment in a person's life when they come to the place that they realize that the Son of God <coughs> loves them, cares about them, is seeking them, and that they've been fighting against and rebelling against the very Son of God. But of course, Jesus had a wonderful plan for Paul. And as Paul said, Jesus told him to rise and stand on thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of both these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So Paul, as he stood before Agrippa and Festus and all that congregation of people, he endeavored to persuade them. As he had the feelings, he was reasoning with them. He was reasoning with them of righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. He was reasoning with them about how he had arrived at the understanding that he had. He was explaining that there was a supernatural vision that had come to him. He was explaining that he was going one way, and on that road to Damascus, he was turned around and pointed the other direction. That he became a different person because of coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because he came to the point where he knew that Jesus was the Son of God. Paul did not stand there and threatened. He was not rude or impolite. He endeavored to persuade by giving his testimony. There's power in a person that can give forth the truth in a persuasive way. Backed by the Holy Spirit. Paul was not making anything up. He was simply telling the truth. He was giving the reason real experience that he had gone through. And he showed them the miracle of a changed life and a changed heart. And how he could be what he was there in their midst. When before he had been one of the strictest of the Pharisees and fighting against what he now called. In verse 19 he said to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to that heavenly division. Paul had a choice to make when he was brought to that place on the road to Damascus. Yes, it 
it was a supernatural experience. And there was a tremendous witness to him of the truth of God in a miraculous way. But he still had a choice to make. He had a choice to make to decide to obey what he was told. To give up everything that he had. His position. His friend. His way of life. Paul was a person with some authority. He was a person with some standing among the Jews. And when Jesus Christ came to him on that road to Damascus and revealed himself to him, Paul had to make a choice. He said, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. But showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. <coughs> and he said, this is the reason that the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill, to kill me. Having therefore obtained help from God, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. That was Paul's testimony. That was Paul's message. I believe that it was a very persuasive testimony. I believe that while Paul was speaking, there was silence. People paid attention. They listened to what he had to say. <coughs> the Spirit of God was there witnessing to the truth of that message. Festus as he heard this message, he felt what he, the Spirit of God there working, and heard what Paul had to say. In response, he cried with a loud voice, the scripture says, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning has made you mad. He tried to deny the truth of it by claiming that, that Paul was out of his mind. If Paul was irrational, then the message had no substance. There was no requirement to listen to what he had to say. Paul said simply, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before him also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, he addressed him directly. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? He was asking him, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the prophets and what they had to say? I know that thou believest. He knew enough about King Agrippa to know what he believed. He knew that King Agrippa knew the scriptures and he believed them. And then this notable response by Agrippa, our text scripture, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I'd like you to think for a few minutes with me about what it took to bring that king sitting there, no doubt, on some type of throne in a place of honor before all this assembled multitude of important people and rulers to bring him to the place where he said, Paul. And I think he was just talking to Paul. He was stirred by what he had heard. 
It had resonated with him. Yeah. The truth had resonated with his heart. And God was dealing with him. And he said, Paul, all of us, Think of what he was feeling. Think of the thoughts racing through his mind. I believe he considered at that moment what it would mean to, be, to choose to be a Christian. He thought about what he would have to give up, what he would have to change. He looked at Paul. He looked at what Paul had given up and what Paul's situation was. He understood. He was an intelligent man. He understood what was involved. He was a king. Almost, God persuaded us to me to be a Christian. So you have there the responses of three different men. The Paul of Reason, Felix, then and he trembled and shook under the power of God. Some other time, Bethesda said, Paul, oh, you're mad. You're beside yourself. It's unreasonable. And Agrippa said, all men. A Christian almost not persuaded me to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Of course, it means to be a follower of Christ. But it implies and it's a reality that it, it requires a definite change of heart. It requires that we be converted. It requires that we repent. That we believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. We believe that the blood of Jesus Christ purchased our salvation. And we accept what he has purchased for us. And we believe that he did it for us. And we believe that our, the salvation of our soul. Now, modern religion, much of modern religion today, does not present a difficult choice. It does not present something that requires a lot of humanity. Much of modern religion today, King Agrippa could have said, yes, I'll become a Christian, and it would have been an easy thing to say. Because it wouldn't have had to change. Or at least not very much. He could have still kept on doing pretty much the same thing as he was doing. You see, that's not the reality that the Bible teaches. There are some requirements to become a Christian. Right. King Agrippa had to come face to face with those requirements there. As he sat there and looked at a man that was a prisoner, that was bound because of the gospel. There's a lot of reasons why we should become a Christian. It's the plan of God for the family of man. It's the intention of God that everyone be saved. It's the way to try to find true happiness in life, to find your real purpose in living as a Christian. It is simply a duty that we have to God, our Creator. We have a duty to Him become a Christian. He made us. He has the right of creation. We are responsible to him. And it's simply the right way for a human being to live. God doesn't create a lot of right ways. He created a right way for people to live. And he knows what we need. He knows the needs of the family of man. Created a perfect plan for us to have everything we need. And he knows that we need a personal relationship with God. That there's no way that a person can be truly happy and fulfilled in life outside of that. But there's a part of God placed in his creation 
that desires a relationship with God, that craves and needs a relationship with God. And we need to be a Christian to reap all the rewards of Christianity. The rewards here in this life, but also the rewards of eternity. Now, as we consider becoming a Christian, so the title of our message tonight, Almost a Christian. The reality is that it can be difficult for a person to choose to become a Christian. In some ways, it looks difficult for King Agrippa. When you look at the setting and who he was, it would be a difficult thing for him to become a Christian. Now you might think that if he had a private audience with Paul, maybe it would have been easier for him not to have to make a decision in front of everyone else. But I don't think it would have really made that much difference. And sometimes we as human beings think that it's difficult. Or there will be an easier time. It would be a more convenient season to become a Christian. But the reality is, that it's always the same requirement. There's never a time when there's a different way to become a Christian. If you're ever going to become a Christian, you have to come the same way that every other person before you has come. And every other person after you will have to follow the same path. We must repent. We must believe. We must be converted. Become a new creature in Christ. As you think of King Agrippa, when it came his time to die, don't you think that he remembered with startling clarity? I believe that his mind just focused and brought back a picture of Paul standing before him with his hand outstretched, speaking the words of truth of righteousness of Jesus Christ coming to this earth to die for the family of man and all the death that he died King Agrippa knew he knew personally what happened to Jesus he knew that he was crucified he knew that he was mistreated he knew what he suffered And he remembered. He remembered that he had, had this desire in his heart to become a Christian. And he even voiced it out loud. Almost. I'm almost persuaded. And you know what Paul said to him? I would to God that not only you, but also all that hear me this day. We're both almost and all together, such as I am, except for these bonds. What was Paul? Paul was a Christian. Paul believed it from his head to his feet. He believed with everything that he had and was and his whole being believed in Jesus Christ. He had committed his whole life to be willing to die or to suffer or whatever it took. He was a Christian. And that's what he wanted for King Agrippa. That's what he wanted for Festus and everyone else who was there. He wanted them to be able to have what he had. And he was not wishing something bad or evil on them. He wanted them to have something good. He wanted them to have victory over sin and death and hell. He wanted them to be forgiven, to know what it was like to be guiltless before God. That's a wonderful experience. It's easy to forget sometimes the guilt, the load of guilt that a sinner carries. That's a heavy load. And they run through life trying to find something to take away that load of guilt and 
sin. There's only one way to get rid of it. As we consider the future of humanity, we face judgment. We face eternity. We're going to spend eternity in either heaven or hell. And we will remember the opportunities that we had. We will remember the choices that we made. We don't want to remember what Jimmy Griffin has to remember. We don't want to remember what Felix has to remember. You think about Felix trembling there in the presence of God, knowing, knowing the reality that Paul was saying was true. Delay. Delay. How is that? All oh, most so close. We have a song that we sing at home called Almost Persuaded. It says, Almost Persuaded, now to believe. Almost Persuaded, Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day. On me, I'll call. All those persuaded, come, come today. All those persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Yes. Angels yes. are lingering here. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. Oh, wonder, come. All those persuaded, harvest is past. All those persuaded, doom comes at last. All those cannot avail. All those is but to fail. Sad, sad that bitter way. All those. Spirit deals with hearts here tonight. Don't let it in all most of us. Don't make that true. Do as Paul said. I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day. For both all most and all together, such as I am. Won't you make the decision tonight to become a Christian? May the Lord help us understand the saints. May the Spirit of God deal with your heart and bring you to Thank you.